and welcome to the Legal Edition. I'm your host, Attorney Mary Kay Loyan. Today's guest is Terry Molnar, a founder of the Calvert Social Investment Funds and the Calvert Foundation. He is a pioneer of the first socially responsible mutual funds. He is founder and chair of the Trusteeship Institute and chairman of the Stakeholders Capital. He is also a board member of Ben and & Jerry's and he is an author and lecturer. Let's welcome Dr. Terry Molnar. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. Now, Terry, we've been talking a lot about common good investing. Mm -hmm. Can you please uh, give us some background on common good investing and what it is? I'd be happy to. Um, back in the 1970s, um, I brought together a group of people from, you know, representing environment, labor, etc., uh, and we met every every month for about 18 months. And each month we'd write up the social screens that we thought were the screens that should be used for investing. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that time, we had a very nice document of the, 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 the way to evaluate the environment, the labor, labor practices, and safety with products, et cetera, as a set of social screens. We ended up, in 1982, Wayne Silby and I ended up using those social screens to create the Calvert Social Investment Mutual Funds. Now, the reason I'm describing this, uh, mm -hmm. Mary Kay, is because we need to understand the difference between common good investing, social responsible investing, and impact investing. Yes, definitely. Okay? So, in 1982, the Calvert funds that we created were the first mm -hmm. family of social responsible mutual funds. Uh, today, there's 400 social responsible mutual funds. Many trillions of dollars are invested in, in the market sector. Uh, the Calvert Group is the largest family of such funds. We have about $12 billion under management. Oh, that's quite a bit. Yeah. Um, what, the, what social responsible investing was, which is mm -hmm. what we were doing at Calvert, is we were saying, okay, your highest priority is to maximize the financial return to the shareholders. We accept that. Right. But there's something called civil behavior. Yes. So we created a set of minimum standards mm -hmm. for socially responsible behavior of a company. So a minimum standard for your environmental behavior, for your relationship with your employees, your relationship with the community, et cetera. So this became social responsible investment and many mutual funds emerged. Before, before we created the Calvert Funds, back in the 1970s, there, was, there were small little activities going on starting to happen around the country of tax exempt organizations charitable organizations making loans to help reduce poverty, making loans to businesses, to cooperatives, to all kinds right. of things. This was called community investment back in those days. Today it's been given the term impact investing. And that's because impact investing now, now uh, includes a much larger spectrum of what was in the beginning called community investing. So it encompasses community investing. That's right. So now what we call impact investing mm -hmm. includes loans to businesses in poor communities, loans to cooperatives, microloan programs which are all over the world, small loans to help poor people get out of poverty, right. um, social enterprises, there's a whole social enterprise world. Mm -hmm. So impact investing is the new word that was, that was kind of created by Jed Emerson and Anthony Bug Levine when they wrote the book Impact Investing. I see. And so that's become the umbrella term for what we used to call community investing. And today, all over the country, there's community development financial institutions mm -hmm. called CDFIs, which is the acronym for that. And so that's the main way that these things receive money and get activities in the United States. But there's lots of other kinds of enterprises as well. Muhammad Yunus, it should be pointed out, Muhammad Yunus was the founder of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which was one of the first microloan programs. And Muhammad Yunus, you know, about five years ago, received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in this. So Muhammad okay. Yunus has started a new thing called social business. His idea is that social businesses are businesses that don't return any money to the investor. The investor invests but doesn't get a return, just gets their money back. Now why is he doing that? Right. He is doing that because he says this should be one of the, one of the options on the spectrum of investing. You can have way on this end is making a lot of money, but way on this end should be investing where you don't make any money, you're just doing it to make the world a better place. So that's Muhammad Yunus's idea. So now that's all a part of what we call impact investing today. So what's common good investing? So all that's a setup to be right. able to explain what common good investing <laughs> right. is now. Okay. Well, here's the way to come, come in understanding common good investing. 
If there's two human beings standing together somewhere, they have two choices. They can compete or they can cooperate. If they choose to compete, they have chosen to return to the level of skill and ability that we had before we developed this elaborate languages that we have and the, the ability of self-consciousness. So they've chosen just to compete to get what they want. But if they choose to cooperate, they have made an agreement to give priority to the common good of the two of them. That's mm -hmm. what cooperation is. Cooperation is when the parts give priority to a whole. So compete basically is, is, is human nature, is it's very competitive. Competing is totally human nature, but it's a lower level of maturity exactly. of human maturity. So when you reach higher levels of maturity, you choose to cooperate. So it's more of a cerebral thing, let's say. the. Uh, the common good investing. It has well, the knowledge and the forethought. Well, let, let me go a little further okay. if I may. So this will give, give it some meat on these bones. Sure. So if they choose to cooperate, what have they done? They've said, let's agree, the two of us, to give priority to the common good of both of us. And within that, we may play some sports, we may compete, we may even set up an economy and compete there. But the priority will be, the priority, and that key word is priority, the priority will be the common good of us all. Mm -hmm. All competition or games or anything else will be secondary in importance. So common good, in, so if those two people join with other people to do this, we call it a society. Yes. So now, it doesn't make any difference how the society is structured. It could be structured as a democracy, as a communist system, as a dictatorship, as a theocracy. That's all secondary. Because whatever agreement is being used as mm -hmm. a secondary level to structure the society is secondary to the idea that the whole idea is to have an agreement to give priority to the common good one way or the other. So it's a form of altruism. I wouldn't say that. No? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that. Because now we get into what is in common good investing. So common good investing then says, ah, if this is the case, if a society, no matter how it's structured, is where we all agree to give priority to the common good, well then if somebody has decided or a group has decided to give priority to their own self-interest or the self-interest of the group, they have left the society mm -hmm. and they no longer are a member of it. I see. So common good investing says to all corporations and all businesses and all for-profit and non-profit enterprises and all government agencies, is your priority the common good of the society or not? If it is not the common good, we want to call you out. We want everybody to know who you are. Because you've left the society and you're not competing with our society. And we should know who you are. So common good investing invests in companies that have comfortably stood up and said, hey, I get it. My highest priority is the common good of the whole society. My second priority is maximizing the financial return for my shareholders. And we all know that companies that do good, they actually act, make more money. They do. Yeah. yeah, if you take a look at the, uh, the longest running social index is the KLD 400 social index. Mm -hmm. So if you compare it to the S&P 500, it has consistently outperformed the S&P 500 for oh. 21 years almost 22 years now. That's a track record. Most people think you have to give up some financial return mm -hmm. to invest socially responsibly. The opposite's the case. <laughs> but it's taken us many years to try to get that message out. But allow me to say one more thing, if I can, about common good investing. Sure. I don't think we're quite ready for common good capitalism, common good corporations, and common good investing. But I think we will be because I think it's inevitable that we'll get there because it's part of the maturation of the human species. Oh, I hope so. But, but I think that common good investing is the next phenomenon in the investment community that'll happen. And I could describe to you in more detail, if you like, how I sure. think that'll happen. Well, that was actually my next question. What are some of the similarities of, uh, between social responsibility and uh, impact and um, the differences, the, you know, the subtle differences? So, very specifically, socially responsible investing sets some minimum civic behaviors, mm -hmm. but it doesn't threaten the highest priority being the financial return to the shareholders. Okay. Okay? Impact investing says, we're gonna give priority to one or more social goods. We're gonna care about the environment more, we're gonna care about the employees more, we're gonna care about the community more. One or more of those, we're gonna give priority to those, and second priority to profit. So mm -hmm. that's impact investing. Common good investing is when we say, whoa, wait a minute. This is not a choice activity. <laughs> we're either a member of the society or not. Right. If we're a member of the society, it doesn't make any difference what kind of investing we're doing. Our highest priority has to be the common good of the society. And our second priority can be our mission, can be profit, can be self-interest, can be anything else. But the highest priority has to be the common good. Now, it's important to point out, throughout almost all of history, what has been the definition of moral behavior? Ah, 
moral behavior has been defined as freely choosing to give priority to the common good. Ha <laughs> ha! So common good investing is moral investing mm -hmm. at, at, at its core. Okay. Now, I know you've seen a, a merger between common good capitalism and investing. Do you want to explain a little bit uh, more on that sure. topic? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So how will this come about in the private sector? How will common good, how will we go from kind of classical capitalism and neo-capitalism, yes. as we call it today, to common good capitalism? How mm -hmm. will that happen in the private sector? And here's the way I think it'll probably occur. There'll be an organization created something like Common Good Enterprise Association. Mm -hmm. The Common Good Enterprise Association will allow any for-profit or non-profit company to become a part of it. However, in order to become a part of it, you must publicly declare that your highest priority is the common good and that you're going to endeavor to play that out in all that you do in your organization. Mm -hmm. So you're joining the moral society. Right. And, and you're doing that publicly, mm -hmm. okay? So you can't become a member if you're not comfortable doing that. So the whole world will know that if you're a member of this association, you have made that declaration. Isn't that what the benefit corporations trying to accomplish that same type the, of goal? Uh, yes, what, what uh, Jay Cohen Gilbert and Andrew and the other folks doing the, the B Corp, mm -hmm. they're very much moving in that direction. But they haven't gone so far as to declare what they're talking about in terms of priorities. Mm -hmm. And prioritization is the key. Because whatever we, we always have a priority. Like right now, my priority is to be talking to you, okay? I can't escape having a priority. And since I always have a priority, everything else I do is always secondary in accommodating that priority. So we need to talk in terms of priorities now. Right. What we've been talking in terms of is this or that in time and space, and you can take your choice, blah, 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 blah. And as long as you got a lot of things on your list, maybe that's neat. That doesn't talk about priorities. Priority is the key construct we have to be using to move into the world of common good capitalism. So the first stage of maturity is when you join the organization. Mm -hmm. But there's two other stages of membership that are possible. The second stage of membership I'm calling right now the 10% club. Uh -huh. And that's when you say, okay, I'm not only going to join this organization, but I'm going to take 10% of my net profits every year. I'm not going to donate them. I'm going to invest them in common good investment funds that are in the business of buying companies and converting them to be common good mm -hmm. third, third level of membership companies. And I'll explain third level in a minute here. But the idea is that every year I'm going to take that money, I'm going to invest it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The third stage of maturity, after becoming a member, then becoming a 10% club member, mm -hmm. the third group is the, uh, the cap member. The cap member means you put a cap on the return to equity. I see. So if I'm General Motors or IBM or, or Google, mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, uh, I'm a pretty mature company now, and so I'm going to give my, my investors a return of 15%. Now I'm going to try to make sure I give them a 15% return every year, okay. but no more. Okay, I'm going to put a cap. Mm -hmm. If I make more than 50% profit, what will I do with the money over and above the 15%? I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. I do the same thing that the 10% club is doing. I invested in those common good investment funds. And what do they do? They buy companies and they convert them to be stage three, cap companies mm -hmm. that already have a cap on their return on investment. Now you might say, well, what would you like the cap to be? Well, actually, I was going to ask you, and how does that cap stack up against what companies are uh, doing right now? Well, most multinationals, you know, I'm a part of Ben & Jerry's, and we're a right. part of Unilever, so I see the, you know, the information about multinationals very easily. And most multinationals are trying to get a 12 to 15 percent return. They would like to get that, especially in consumer goods, okay? Okay, so that's the average return on investment. That's what they'd like to get. You know, they usually will get in around 12 percent on yeah. average. We're talking averages here. Average, right. But... When a company sets its cap, becomes part of the cap club, mm -hmm. we don't care what the cap is. I see. We don't care. Just make it public. Then there'll be a public conversation about what's the appropriate cap. So if you're a venture fund and you're just getting started, set it at 100%. Set it at 200%. But if you're Procter & Gamble and you're the largest consumer products company on the planet mm -hmm. and you used to have 1,500 products and today you have only 250 and almost every one of them is number one and number two in its market share on the planet. Well, I think you should be down around 12%. Now, let's get into that uh, that issue. Let's explore the issue of duopolies. Okay. I think the viewers would really like to uh, know what that really means. Well, 
one of the things that the general public is not very aware of today mm -hmm. is that the highest priority in the multinational community is to become a duopoly. What's a duopoly? Right. A duopoly is when two companies basically control a market share. In 1981, Jack Welch, when he was the uh, um, CEO of General Electric, mm -hmm. at an annual meeting of the board of directors, he said, if you're not number one or number two in your product, get out of it. What was he saying? Reading between the lines, it's clear what he was saying. What he was saying was a monopoly is illegal, but a duopoly is legal where two companies control a market. I'm on the board of Ben and & Jerry's. Ben and & Jerry's and haagen we control 86% of the super premium ice cream market in the United States. We've expanded into basically the same 30 nations around the planet. Nestle's is the second largest consumer products company on the, on the planet after Procter & Gamble, and Unilever's the third. Mm -hmm. We know we're gonna be number one and number two in the super premium ice cream market. Who's gonna be able to stop us? Right. Okay. And so the goal of all companies is to become number one and number two in your product area. If you're not getting the kind of margins or, you know, or the control of the market, you know, if you're not becoming number one or two in the market, get out of it. Unilever this year sold Skippy peanut butter. Why did it sell Skippy peanut butter? It couldn't make the margin of profit that it likes to make, and it wasn't controlling 2%, you know, it wasn't a duopoly kind of a situation. So they didn't have a lot of control and they couldn't get the margins. Well, they want to be in high margin businesses, not low margin, so they sold that to somebody else who thought they could do better. Oh. So, you know, just look, look around the, your, your neighborhood. CVS Walgreens, Home Depot Lowell's, Verizon, uh, AT&T. Mm -hmm. You it's know, everywhere. The, every place you look, what is going on, the, the private conversation in the, in the corporate community is, let's become a duopoly mm -hmm. and every product or get out of it. Mm -hmm. What about a triopoly? Have you seen any of those? Well, sure. There, before there's duopolies, there's always triopolies and quadruopolies, et cetera. Like, for instance, in the, in the telephone business, Sprint is a third one that's mm -hmm. coming on strong in the telephone mm -hmm. area. So yes, but it's the same concept. Let's mm -hmm. just have two or three companies controlling a market so we can make sure that we can control the margin of profit mm -hmm. on those products. Yeah, we saw that um, many years ago with the Bells. There was the concept and the, the government had to step in and break, right. break them up. Uh, do you right. see that um, happening with these duopolies? That takes us to another very interesting territory. <laughs> um, and. Maybe we should talk about that here. Um, this year, last February, I was at the Davos organization, the, mm -hmm. the Davos meeting. The World Economic Forum mm -hmm. um, has a meeting every year at this ski resort in Switzerland called Davos. Right. And it's where all the heads of all the multinationals and all the, the very strong economic players on the planet get together mm -hmm. and have a big conference, a global conference, all right? So I was invited to go this year, and so I went. Let me share with you the conversation I had with many CEOs. I, Mike Duke of, of Walmart, uh, JP, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, uh, Endura Nuri of Pepsi, Larry Summers, you know, he's not head of a corporation, but he was former Secretary of the Treasury, et cetera. With about 20 of these kinds of folks, I had this conversation, and I made sure I had the same conversation with every one of them. I thought, I want to see if I can plan an idea here, mm -hmm. rather than talk about my cat and my dog and my kids. <laughs> And so each time I was introduced to them, uh, I said, um, what, uh, I want to, I, I said, I want to bring up an idea to you. Mm -hmm. And they said, sure. I said, as we know, the highest priority of the multinational community is to become number one or number two in your product area. So right away they recognized that I was in the inside club because that's the conversation we don't really have outside very much, okay? I then said, um, so the question becomes, what happens when there's such a plethora of these duopolies everywhere that the public becomes aware of it? How do the duopolies then protect themselves? I said, because the political left is gonna say, this is just a monopoly with another face. Right. How do you then protect your duopoly? Mm -hmm. The first thing to point out is nearly every single face just went blank. They'd never had that question enter their mind. Mm. So I s quickly answered the question for them, and I said, the only thing the public will respect is if the two of you give priority to raising the level, labor, social, and environmental playing field, creating a cooperative context around your competition. 
every single one of them look back at me and say, yes, you're right. You hit the nail. Now, stop and think about that. Why would they so easily say, yes, you're right? But I should say one person didn't say, yes, you're right. And that was Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. the largest investment bank in the world. Oh, what did Jamie say? And Jamie looked, me, looked at me and he said, that's illegal. And he started to walk away. And I said, Jamie, you know there's a legal way to do it. It's called setting standards. He smiled and laughed broadly and said, <laughs> yes, you're right. The other day in the paper, it was reported that the Airlines Association, which doesn't have all the airlines in the world, but has lots of them, had a meeting. And they reached an agreement that they would reveal to each other who their business clients were mm -hmm. so that they could charge them more when they're on planes with tourists. They called this raising standards. Mm -hmm. Sounds like collusion to me, mm -hmm. which is illegal, it's right? It's kind of like, you know, let's charge for baggage and then everybody else charges for a baggage exactly. fee. Right. The fact is that cooperation is fundamental in human nature. Mm -hmm. You can't escape it. So to feign that you're giving priority competition is an illusion. And so it is an illusion we're going to grow out of. But once we grow out of it, we'll then say, well, what is cooperation? And we'll realize that cooperation, like what is cooperation on my body? Both of my hands give priority to the good of the whole body. Right. All right? That's what cooperation is, when you give priority to the whole. But when we come to understand that the universe is, is an indivisible whole. And society whole, is a whole. And society is a whole. All these things are holes. Then you're going to have to say, hmm, what's your priority here? Mm -hmm. And if your priority is something other than the common good of the whole, you're like a hand that's left the body mm -hmm. and is no longer a part of it and is now competing with it. Geez, we can also stop wars with that type of uh, philosophy as well. You know, I was really pleased, a little, a little aside here, that Obama gave such a strong speech at the United Nations yesterday mm -hmm. because he's been panned a lot, like becoming weak because he didn't exercise the military threat on Syria. Moving to giving priority to agreement reaching is a maturation of our society, and that's where we want to go. It's a higher level. Yeah, that's right. Okay, let's, let's move back a little bit to our, um, we were talking about the common good and 80% of investment dollars on Wall Street you think will be invested in the common good. Um, can we touch on that a bit? Good idea. 80% um, of the money on Wall Street is people's retirement accounts, their pension funds, their, you know, it's not hot money that's trying to get a quick profit. Mm -hmm. It wants to just have a nice steady profit mm -hmm. so, it can re so the people can retire. Right. That's like 80% of the money on Wall Street, all right? Um, if we end up with common good enterprise association and lots of companies begin to join it and it becomes clear that they have become cap, mm -hmm. cap uh, club members, right. that, and they set their, their uh, priority, say we're going to try to get a 12% return for our investors. Mm -hmm. Anything they make over and above 12%, they'll invest, so that becomes you know, retained assets that mm -hmm. can protect. And then the dividend can be such that no matter whether the market's up or down, you will always get your 12% return. Mm -hmm. Well, 80% of the money on Wall Street will love that option. <laughs> they'll just run right, right for that, because financial planners say to their clients, you know, and I'm a financial planner, so we say to our clients, as everybody else does, we're gonna try to get you a nine to 11% return. Well, if I can give you a consistent 12% return on some of the strongest companies on the planet, mm -hmm. I think we're going to put a lot of your portfolio in that, mm -hmm. in that bucket. So that's the way the investor will participate in the conversion to common good investing. There's another way that the consumer will participate. Let's say that there's Pepsi, Coca-Cola. Okay, those are the two big soft, soft drink companies. So let's say Pepsi and Coca-Cola both come out publicly saying, we don't believe in this common good stuff. We're totally against mm -hmm. it. You know, that is anti-American. It's <laughs> anti-capitalism. It's anti-anti-anything good. It's bad, right. bad, bad, bad. Well, the public then says, okay, let's talk to um, Honest Tea, <laughs> which has gotten bought by Coca-Cola now. But right. let's talk to some other beverage companies, and let's start putting out a line to compete with Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and let's start a whole movement of supporting the emergence of a common good soda company. Mm -hmm. With something very public like that, which a whole lot of people, especially young people, can get all excited about as they come to understand this. If you're Pepsi or Coca-Cola, you're going to quickly sit down and say, is this really worth it? What are we giving up if we become part of this common good you know, mm -hmm. business association? 
well, we're not really giving up much of anything other than not doing bad things, which we kind of don't want to do anyway. And mm -hmm. so do we do very many bad things? No, we don't do too many bad things. We could just stop doing those things. And we could end up with uh, the, the public being very supportive of us, and we'll make more money in the long term. Mm -hmm. So this is a private sector market way that the consumer will participate in bringing about this maturation into common good capitalism. I see. So I guess the, the, the last thing I'm going to be asking you is basically how will all this affect our GDP? All this common good and all these, you know, what's going to happen in your view? Well, you know, my friend Hazel Henderson is fond of saying that the GDP includes everything from guns and killing to making mm. cake frosting. And um, the gross domestic, domestic product should go up. And part of the reason it'll go up is because our companies will begin to become loved. I mean, we have some of the strongest for-profit companies on the planet, and we're all over the planet. If you go to China, you see Kentucky Fried Chicken everywhere. What, if we become the leaders of the maturation of capitalism into a more moral form of capitalism, our companies will become more loved and more appreciated. And so it should have our GDP and everything go up. But there's a couple other things I would add here that I also think will be phenomena that, will, that mm -hmm. will happen, and I won't go into detail about those here, but I think one of the other things is something else that I'm involved with starting, which is called Trust for All Children. And this is a way for people to participate in a crowdfunding program mm -hmm. that would end up creating a $10,000 trust for their children, their grandchildren, and poor children mm. in such a way to where we grow every month to where eventually someday, some generations out, every child on the planet would be born with a $10,000 trust fund in today's Kind of like dollars. a dowry, so to speak. Yes. Why should only rich kids have trust funds? <laughs> That's true. Why shouldn't everybody have a small trust fund that other people can add to as they grow mm -hmm. that, to keep everybody out of extreme poverty? So that's another phenomenon that I think is going to happen. That's a great idea. Well, it's, you know, I was just talking to the Kellogg Foundation about it this morning, and I think mm -hmm. we might get funded to try to launch this. Mm -hmm. That's another phenomenon that I think is going to happen. Uh, another phenomenon I think is going to happen is that... Um, something I'm also involved with launching called Crew Fund, mm -hmm. which is a way to create an endowment fund around mm -hmm. every local community mm -hmm. where the individual members decide where the money gets invested in which businesses in the local community. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any difference how many losses you have. Wow. Because everybody's donating $11 a month. So this is kind of like the common good... Um Exemplified across the board. Well, yeah, what I'm by using those two examples, I'm trying to point out there's a new way of thinking emerging. I see. And this new way of thinking has new systems wow. of being of service to the society. Well, Terry, the, you've really enlightened us today. I want to thank you for coming. You're welcome. This has been uh, quite enlightening, to say the least. And I want to thank our viewers for um, tuning in today. Uh, this is part one of our two-part series with Dr. Mahler on social responsibility and common good investing. Um, we want to thank Terry again for coming. And please remember, this is for informational uh, purposes only. Um, go to our website if you have any other questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. And please tune in next time with part two with Dr. Mahler. We'll see you next time on The Legal Edition. Mm -hmm.